This podcast contains potentially adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly sexual context. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Drinking with Authors podcast. I'm your host, Erica Lance. My co-host today is C.R. Rice. And our amazing guest today is Brian Finney. Thank you. They added Thank your you. track. They, it's fine. It's good. Okay, let's talk about what we're drinking so people can drink along. Today, I am back at my Angry Orchard Peach Mango Hard Cider. It's very, it's very yummy. Chelsea, what are you drinking today? I am doing my standard rum and Coke, Captain and Coke. Awesome. Brian, what are you drinking? I'm, I'm drinking a Goose, a Goose IPA beer. Wonder okay. Bar. Wonder Bar. Okay. So let's start with the fans out there that may not know you. Can you talk about what you write a little bit? Um, well, now I write fiction. Um, I mean, in the past, I wrote, I've written like uh, seven nonfiction books. Um, but when I stopped teaching full time, I decided that I've been talking about fiction all this time. It was about time I wrote it. So I've since then written two, uh, published two um, novels. One is called Money Matters, which is a kind of pun, you know, because money does matter, but at the same time, it's about money matters. Uh, it's about the wealthy uh, and this, the, the, the protagonist is a very young woman uh, who comes up against these forces of the rich and the powerful. And the second is called Dangerous Conjectures, which is a, a quote actually from Hamlet and which looks at um, America in 2020, the beginning of 2020, when it was uh, beginning to look more and more like, um, you know, the state of Denmark, remember? Oh, what? yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So what did you, so you said you wrote um, books previous to this. What yeah. did you do? So you were teaching? Were you a professor? I was a professor, yes. I was a professor, first of all, in uh, London University. Um, uh, I was in the equivalent of what you would call the extension department there. Um, in other words, I hired uh, teachers and lecturers uh, in all of the arts uh, to put on either lectures or courses for the London public, not for, you know, the undergraduate students. And, um, you know, that would involve liaising with places like the National Gallery and the Institute of Contemporary Arts and the British Film Institute and so on. Uh, and it was great fun. Um, well, it sounds like that could be a lot of fun. What did you write books on then? Well, you know, gradually I went over more and more from the administering of the program to teaching literature, which is my own subject. And as I did that, I first of all, I did a PhD while I was working um, on D.H. Lawrence. And then um, I started, well, I actually, I wrote a, uh, a letter to the Irish Times about some guy who had written a letter into them saying how Beckett's latest uh, prose uh, works were gibberish and that anybody could write as well and he produced you know he then produced a little paragraph of gibberish and I wrote back to the Times saying look if you actually look at that piece it actually contains 60 sentences repeated twice in specific orders it contains certain images that are gradually developed so in other words it was a very mathematically very clearly worked out piece of you know piece of writing and they liked that so they then started uh, asking me to you know, review for them. In the meantime, a, a friend of mine had started up a new series for the Covent Garden Press and he asked me to do one on Beckett, on Beckett's latest prose fiction. So uh, that was my first non-fiction book, uh, which took me actually to see Beckett uh, in Paris for, you know, I spent an hour in his favorite cafe. And, you know, <laughs> oh, that's a fun <laughs> story. That's yeah. super exciting. Sorry? That sounds super exciting. It was, Did you it was, like fanboy out a little bit? It was it was so exciting for, for for the first time in my life. I actually clammed up completely for the first fifteen minutes or so. He had to keep the conversation going. Oh he had to sort of, 
steely gray eyes that sort of pierced into the back of your head almost. You know, you felt as though he was reading everything you didn't want anybody to read about you. <laughs> he was seeing into your soul. <laughs> so after that, um, I decided that I wanted to write um, about a writer who I admired and who had no books written about him at all, but who was very influential. And that was Christopher Isherwood. And he had written the Berlin stories on which Cabaret was based, if you remember. I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, Cabaret was a very glamorized version of the Berlin stories because all these, you know, nightclubs uh, and particularly, you know, the boy nightclubs and so on were, were extremely sleazy, he said. <laughs> the nightclubs that are show up in Cabaret are incredibly, you know, she Pretty, Yeah, they're yeah. flashy, much they're more flashy. Fla exactly, they're flashy, yeah. So I decided, okay, since nobody has written about him, I, I'll write a critical biography. And a critical biography is where you write about the, the person and the work, you, and you criticize the work as well, analyze the work. Really. Um, so that took me across to the United States, to uh, Santa Monica, where he lived by then. Uh, although, you know, he left, he left with Auden. He left uh, England in 1939, and Auden settled in New York. And he didn't like New York, so he came across the West Coast and he settled with a whole lot of refugees from Europe, um, you know, um, Stravinsky and uh, Mann and so on. I mean, it was, a, it was quite a, an expatriate community that he joined. And eventually he became a champion of gay rights in, uh, you know, in Southern California, which is, which is incidentally where I, I have lived since 1987 when I immigrated to America. There. Oh you! Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I spent half my life in, in Britain and half my life in, in California. <laughs> and how would you compare the two? Uh, London is a very exciting city to, to live in, or was at that time at any rate. Um, it hadn't it hadn't been bought up and half emptied by Russian oligarchs, et cetera. You know, there are whole series sections of London now that are, are empty for most of the year because they are, the property has been bought by Russians and other, you know, Arab foreigners, et cetera, who, who anybody who's wealthy. Um, and they only go there for maybe a month in the year. So for the rest of the year, the place is, looks deserted. So there are segments of London that are a little dead, uh, but well, of course a lot of London's not like that. I don't know, I, I really like London as an exciting city, but I think that Los Angeles is an up and coming city, whereas London is a sort of, particularly since Brexit is not exactly up and coming. I mean, it's trying to survive the shock, you know, of losing, uh, you know, it's, it's financial clout, et cetera. No, totally. I was um, actually in London when um, the Brexit thing went into place. I was uh -huh. visiting, yeah, and, it was interesting because everybody thought I was doing a little bit of a European tour for my company and everybody thought London would be the easiest part. And it really was not because of the passports and the issues and who had what, and because it used to be the European passport got mm. you in and then you couldn't yeah. use it. anyway. It was like, I was like, this seems like a terrible idea. And everybody I spoke to over there, which was not a vast majority of people thought that they had been a little bit swindled by Brexit at the time. Like they thought what was said to them and what was like public relation and then what occurred were two totally different things. It was, I mean, they were lied to by Johnson and Company, definitely. Um, and of course, London it was a sort of center of anti-Brexit sentiment. I mean, the vast majority of Londoners didn't want to leave the European community. I have friends there who, who say, you know, I was a European and now, you know, I feel stateless. I mean, it was, and they, and they even have houses in France, you know, and so on. And they have to go through all the paperwork you mentioned in order to just to go and, you know, spend a few weeks there. Yeah, which used to be really easy. Okay, yeah. so yeah. it sounds like you did a lot of um, writing and traveling with the books you did before you did the fiction books. Oh, very, very much so. I mean, even going back to, you know, the, the PhD in Lawrence, which I did on his shorter fiction, which is probably his best work at any rate, all the manuscripts were in American libraries. So in 1970 and 71, I got traveling scholarships and did the East Coast one time and the West Coast the next time. And that was my first experience of America. Um, 
And uh, it was amazing what, what I turned up because nobody had done this, uh, this fundamental work at all. So I would go to, um, shall we say, the New York Public Library and look up the manuscript of a novella of his. And I would compare the exercise book in which he'd written the book, the story, with the actual printed version. And lo and behold, the printer had missed out a double page. And luckily, you know, X finished talking at the bottom of that, the, the, the end page, the, the first page, and Y started talking on the beginning of the, you know, the three pages later. So nobody had noticed this. So I was able to, I, and a, a lot of the that kind of thing turned up. I mean, in, in New Haven, um, I found uh, uh, the manuscript version of an, uh, a story, the publisher of which had lost the second half um, when he was wanting to bring it out. Wow. And Lawrence rewrote it, the second half of the story, but it was a kind of broken back rewriting because he wasn't the same person any longer and he didn't have the same what should I say, ideological outlook as he had when he first wrote the story. So um, I was able to, you know, <coughs> turn, turn around the finger and say, look, this is the real, the real story and this is the real second half and you need to, you know, restore it to where, where it was. Did they restore it? Sorry? Did they I, restore it? Did they fix it? Yeah, oh, they did. They certainly restored it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were happy. How, many, how much time went by? Like, how long was it out with those missing pieces? Before, like, were you the person that went to them and was like, hey, guys, in um, case you were wondering? <laughs> that's a good question. It was in, I, I can't give it exactly, but in the mid 20s, it was published in its, you know, sort of distorted version. And I got Penguin to alter it in the early 70s. So, so 50 time. years. That's <laughs> Nobody noticed that there was something wrong, that there was some miscommunication somewhere along the line. Right, right. It's interesting. That's crazy. Yeah. It was a fun, fun piece of research to do because nobody had really done it before. And therefore, there was a lot of, you know, interesting and new stuff to be found. Well, and what made you decide to get your PhD in this? This is oh. an interesting thing to get one's yeah. PhD in. So what made you go, well, I'm gonna go do this? <laughs> it's a doctorate. Um, I, well, what happened was, it was um, when I left university, I had to do national service. I was the last year of you know, compulsory national service. So I went into the Air Force um, and I was in the education branch there, helping airmen get through their promotion exams or getting them into university. And constantly, just when I was ready to get them to sit down to the exam, they'd be rushed off to Cyprus or somewhere. It was a transport command station. Uh, and I thought, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to spend my life on the sidelines um, when, you know, everything I'm attempting to do is, is, so to speak, displaced by something so-called more important. So I went into industry as a graduate apprentice. And I went in first, uh, first of all, I did internal consultancy for Joseph Lucas, which is the big electrical car firm in England. And then uh, I was offered the job of um, um, production control manager at the equivalent of uh, I ITT. Uh, it, was a, it was a quartz crystal factory. And the sales department had been saying, we need the production to be doubled. You know, we've got all these customers and there's this backlog of 10 weeks. And so I put up a chart in my office and after about a year, I got production doubled. At which point the sales manager in a you know, major meeting said, uh, um, well, um, actually it turns out it was just the backlog. There isn't really additional sales and we need the production to be brought down again to where it was before. So, oh my God. <laughs> so I look at this graph like that, and I think, well, if this is what, you know, being in the mainstream is about, forget it. So I applied for a job in what they call the extramural department, what we call the extension department of London University, and got it. Um, and, you know, because I got administrative skills, but I hadn't got a, a higher degree. So then I decided, and I was teaching one course as well myself. And so I decided, look, if you like teaching, which I did, uh, and you want to do more with it, you're going to have to obviously get yourself qualified. So that's when I took up the, the Lawrence PhD, the, you know, the doctorate. Wow. Okay, so you do that second book and you're traveling to the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States in the 70s, which had to be a hoot. 
It was. In fact, Venice was particularly a hoot at that time. I mean, it was you know, hippie haven. Yes, yes. <laughs> that would be so much fun to go across the whole United States during that time period and just see how different the East to the West Coast was. That must Very have been incredible. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, one of the ways I, I, I put it was on the East Coast, the first question you're asked is, what do you do, you know, for work? And on the West Coast, they do anything but ask you that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is so true. Okay, so book two is under your belt. Where does book three come into play? Uh, so, okay, let me think. So then, then um, okay, so then I decided that I, uh, the job that I was doing in London um, under Thatcher, the entire budget, budget got dramatically and savagely cut. And by then I was the equivalent of a sort of part-time, part-chair. Um, and so I was, you know, in fact, administering and making work cuts that I didn't agree with at all. In the meantime, to uh, finance the issue with, uh, for example, research, I had gone and done summer, summer school for UCLA and USC. Um, and I liked that a lot. So I thought, okay, why don't I just, you know, immigrate and go and teach, which is the one thing I can, you know, I can do happily and get rid of all this administrative stuff. So I immigrated in 1987, having applied for positions in a, one of those job fairs that's called MLA, Modern Language Association Conference, in New York previous winter. Got nothing. And I was standing in my flat with everything in boxes. Uh, I was leaving the following day, if I remember, or two days away. Um, and the phone, which hadn't been disconnected or was due to be disconnected, rang. And the chair of UC Riverside uh, said, um, are you still free? And I said, yes, why? And she said, well, the person we offered the job to first had already accepted one and got and signed a contract. So you were next on the list and um, you, you know, would you like to be our visiting professor? <laughs> so it was a very, very soft landing. In fact, they actually were paying me from before I, before I left England. <laughs> oh, wow, that was <laughs> well <laughs> done. That's so, definitely one of those giant check boxes. So yeah. you, you go through all of this and then you're like, I'm done. How come you didn't write fiction before? Well, you know, once I, end, this is what I was about to explain actually, that once I entered the American university system and, you know, I, I, oh, it was great having a visiting professorship, full professor for two, two years, but after that, I was thrown on the job market. And um, for quite a while, I, I was a freeway flyer, as they call them, you know, part-time, part-time lecturer. Yeah. I mean, I was full time, but doing it part-time in various, various universities in Southern California. So, um, that, you know, in order to get out of that situation, you have to be published in your own subject. So, uh, the, the, you know, the first thing I did was uh, actually because um, the whole of, you know, post-structuralist theory has become all the rage, I decided to take hold of Lawrence's most popular book, Sons and Lovers, and to apply each of those theories to it in a different chapter. Um, and Penguin brought that out. So, after that, um, I, I'd already done, actually, I'd already done a, a study of autobiography, of literary autobiography by different uh, writers. Uh, and after that, I, I, I decided, okay, I've done so much of British authors, I might as well make myself a specialist in that area of contemporary British writing. So I brought out a book uh, called um, English Fiction Since 1984, being you know, a reference to Orwell. <laughs> and you know, looking at because the you know the writers of that eight, that eighties Thatcher period were really interesting. I mean, including you know, I'm sure you've heard a number of them, uh, but you know, uh, Martin Amis was one one who I was particularly interested in. Ian McEwan, Salman Rushdie, of course, and amongst uh, the women there was Jeanette Winterson, and there was Angela Carter, who's writing a love. She's a sort of grotesque goth gothic novelist, always you know great descriptions. So, um, you know, that's, that's what I spent my time doing, basically. Once I got promoted to full professor, which, and, and I mean, you know, it took me a while just to get a tenured appointment. Um, and what got me actually was a very clever chairwoman who um, 
she was only allowed to advertise in areas that weren't mine, but she made, she made all of them and theory. And I was the one who was most into theory in that, in that department. So she then persuaded the Dean to create a, a position in theory alone in addition. Um, and that's how I started off becoming the, what should I say, the old, oldest assistant professor in America, I think. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, although luckily they paid me for you know what I was used to being we paid as a full professor I had to work my way back up the, the theoretical ladder but once I'd done that then I decided I can I could write what I like uh, but instead of writing fiction and this was very very near the end of uh, full-time teaching I decided to um, because it, it had just recently occurred I decided to write a book called Terrorized How the War on Terror Affected American Culture and Society and, um, and I self-published that. Um, and that took me into a completely different area of uh, you know, academic expertise, so to speak. Um, but you know, research is research. I mean, once you learn how to do research, you can apply it to most areas unless it's too technical. Well, uh, that's true. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's something that you are really great at because um, you know, it's interesting. Some authors do a ton of research and go down the rabbit holes of research left and right. Plus, it sounds like you wrote a book, too, to give you previously the one on British authors to give you an excuse to read a bunch of books. I'm just oh, throwing sure. that out there. That was That's a very favorite. good excuse. That's kind of the vibe I was getting, too. You kind of really made something your own and got everything out of it you wanted it. Well, at the same time, being able to pass it off as a job. And that's everybody's dream. Well, I, I, well okay. Um, I, to that extent, yes, I was successful. Yeah. No, it's, it's very true. Um, so when you, what made you make the leap? Like what made you stop writing nonfiction to write fiction? Or at least transition and start writing fiction on top of nonfiction? Well, that, that, yeah, that is the case, although I'm mainly writing fiction. I still write reviews, for example, you know, for things like the Los Angeles Review of Books and so on. Um, you know, I wish I had a, a, a simple, easy answer. Um, my memory is that I somehow or other found myself outlining a novel without realizing what, what was impelling me to do it. Um, and at the same time, I did realize that, you know, I'd spent all that time telling students how to analyze fiction and how fiction worked. And, and that, um, you know, it was so much more fun actually writing it than talking, <laughs> talking about it. And the, the first book, I somehow, uh, I, I, it almost wrote itself. Um, I, I had this young woman narrator protagonist, you know, major character, and, once I got her voice, so to speak, and I was telling the entire thing through her voice, um, it, it told me what to write almost, uh, you, know, you know, because because I was inside this fictional consciousness and I knew in this situation, this is what she'd say or this is how she would react. And in a way it was the exact, I mean, you know, here I am an old male, elderly no, male with an English, English vocabulary, so to speak. And there I was using a young American woman. Uh, so it couldn't have been, I mean, I couldn't have made it more different. And, and that was quite deliberate because uh, I, I didn't want to write something autobiographical at all. Uh, and that, that helped me. But at the same time, the one thing I didn't manage to do for myself was to uh, find her vocabulary. I was still writing as I'm talking to you now. And I'm, every now and again, I'm sure that there's a word or phrase or a pronunciation that comes across to you as not, you know, that's not the way Americans say it or, or, or talk about it. And so I had to have a lot of friends and professional editors and so on go through it and re re remove all the anglicisms from her, her speech, you know. <laughs> oh my God, that's awesome. Okay, we actually have to take a quick break. We're gonna be right back, talk more about this book. Sample locally sourced, quality distilled spirits in the beautiful Columbia River Gorge at Skunk Brothers Distillery. We're family owned, brewing small batch grain to bottle spirits, just like our grandfather did back in the Prohibition era. From handcrafted bourbons and moonshine to flavored blends and cordials infused with local fruit. Join us for a tasting tour and buy Skunk Brothers spirits straight from the source. 
It's all in the family at Skunk Brother Spirits, located in Stevenson, Washington. Okay, we're back. So you decide to write an American woman. You know what's interesting is actually we were just having a debate yesterday, me and um, the lead editor. We have a girl in Australia, not even a girl, she's a female in Australia, I'll say, who wrote a book and she refers to the female in the book all the time as girl, that's my girl, that's whatever, but it's not a small child. And in the US, when you say girl, generally it's a younger female, right? Mm -hmm. And apparently she was saying though, that when you say woman, it's a person over the age of like 65. And I'm like, really? Yeah, and I was like, there's got to be a better word for this. But we started, like, the thesaurus came out. And I'm like, maybe just put the word young in front of woman. I don't even know what to do with this. That's a good way of doing it. Or old old girl. (laughs) Right, and older girl, young woman. Yeah, that seems to be an awkward way of dividing it up, really. I mean, you're... So you go into fiction. Did you self-publish that one, or was that one traditionally published? No, I, I, I self-published both of the, the novels, but I did it with um, a publicist, um, a, very, a, a very good young woman who was extremely media savvy and who, who made me post far more on Twitter and Instagram than I care to myself. <laughs> 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 that is the worst part, is, especially uh, when you want to focus on writing is trying to remember that like nowadays, everything is so much in your face and so much technology. So as you've been publishing through the years, have you noticed a huge change in the way that you have to reach out to people to get your book out there? Absolutely. I mean, she introduced me to a whole world that I had no idea was there. And, you know, if you don't do that, then the book, I mean, I, I forget how many uh Thousands of books come out every day, but you just get buried in a, a morass. It's like you know the town trash heap or something. I mean, it never. I mean, you you can easily tell publish a book and not sell more than half a dozen copies of it to friends. Right. No, it's, it's true. If you're if you don't know what you're doing, it can be like, look, you accomplished that. You have it published, and somebody could buy it somewhere if they could ever find it. Exactly. You know, without a map. Um, yeah. What has so what kind of reviews and stuff did you get for your nonfiction? I I for the nonfiction, well, the the, the Isherwood book um, got a lot of reviews in the uh, English national papers, and actually it was the front page New York Times book review too. Um, and it won the James Tate Black Memorial Prize for biography of that year. Um, so I you know I was really happy with that. It was the one big prize I've, I've ever, you know, won. <laughs> uh, and it was published by Faber and Faber in England, who are, you know, who are like, what should I say, T.S. Eliot's publisher, you know, I mean, that's yeah. what and by uh, Oxford University Press New York in, in America. So that, that was great. I mean, you know, so I mean, I was, I all, in fact, all the nonfiction except for the terrorized book um, was published by very well-known major publishers, one sort or another. What was like that going to, did they want the book before you wrote it or you wrote the book, you handed it to them and they were like, yep, we want this. How does that work? I'm just trying, you know, I'm trying desperately to remember with the issue with book, which, which way round it went. But I, I had, an, I had a, a good agent in London and I think, I think the agent sold, sold the idea of the book to them before it was or it was, maybe it had been, been begun, but it certainly wasn't finished when, when they took it on. I wow. mean, if you think about it, you know, major English writer, biography never been written about before, you know, it's a sort of, it would be hard not to, to, to take it. I mean, of course they take it on on the basis that it's got to read well and so on. Uh, and they can always reject it once they get it. Yeah, no, I was gonna say, I would think, I mean, I think it's a great premise. It's just interesting because we talk a lot on the show about fiction, but it's interesting to talk about nonfiction because I think that has a different set of rules in a way it does, yes. fiction does. Yeah, I and mean, it's got, for, for a start, you know, it's got to be completely backed up. I mean, you know, in terms of notes and so on, but on the other hand, it's got to read fluently, you know. Uh, oh yeah. So, and that requirement in itself is, um, quite different from fiction, where you can 
write as fluently as you like and to hell with it. Whether it's right or wrong, you know, it's fiction, so you can get away with it. No, so how has the transition been between going from like a traditional publisher to self-publishing? Like, does it um, change going from nonfiction to fiction? Did you feel like it was kind of like the same feeling? Not really, no, it wasn't the same feeling. But on the other hand, I mean, late on, the publishers I had for like, you know, the, the book on English fiction since 1984, they do very, very little. I mean, because they're so sh short staffed, they do very little work in terms of, I mean, my publicist has got, between her and me, we've done a lot more than a traditional publisher would have done. Um, so, you know, it, it was and wasn't that different. I mean, I, also it puts you in charge. Uh, I mean, you can decide, you decide on the cover, they don't decide on the cover, you know. You can decide where you want to push it. You know, do you want to, I mean, I, I always, I, I uh, published both of the novels as audiobooks, ebooks, and paperbacks. Um, you know, and you can decide which of those three outlets you want to, you know, put your, your advertising money into and so on. So there, there are as many advantages to self-publishing as, as being published by, I mean, if you're published, you know, as a fiction writer by one of those minor, and there are a large number of them, American small, small presses, you know, publishers, you're probably not going to get as much attention as I do, you know, self-publishing to the publicist to help me. No, that's, it's true. It's the publicist part, because if you don't know that marketing angle and all of that stuff, it becomes a lot more, you know, interesting to do it. When you, um, what, what has it been like getting fans or feedback on your nonfiction versus fiction? Um, to be honest, apart from reviews, you get very little feedback. Uh, with a fiction, of course, you get reviews on Amazon because you need to have those with self-publishing, but they're mainly from friends or people who know you, so you don't trust them because they're not going to write anything nasty. <laughs> <laughs> But the second, the second book, I did get uh, Kirkus reviews to do a review, and that was a, a, a pretty, pretty good review. That, that was really helpful because um, everybody respects Kirkus reviews, just as they do Publishers Weekly. You know. um, but otherwise, you know, the feedback is, is small. Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> the writer's life is a lonely one, and, and the, the, it isn't a very sociable one in terms of writing. You know? <laughs> That's, that's true. Do you have you gone to conventions with your? No, I haven't. I should do, but you know, I I don't like conventions. I had to go to conventions as an academic, uh, which I always considered to be terribly boring, and um, I, I would skip most of the meetings and go and you know do the town instead. <laughs> well, I think that the kind of conventions your books would go to would be very different than those kind of conventions. They I were. feel the same yeah. way. I do yeah. HR for a living and I hate HR conventions. They're the <laughs> worst, literally the worst. And, yeah. um, but writing conventions or conventions like for um, different kinds of books, you get such, it's so neat because your fans do get to come interact with you. They do get to come up to you and tell you how great your book is or how it mm -hmm. meant something to them or which character they like or any of that stuff. Nobody comes up to you at a convention and says something negative. Like you don't have it's that. True. It's true. Mm. You know, there's always a first. There's always going to be that one person <laughs> like that breaks the rule. That's what well, terrifies me. You're going to have I, that I, one person that comes out of left field and is like, I don't even know why you're here. Like, what are you even doing with your life? So. Yes. Yeah, I know. Well, no. I, well, probably what would happen if I did go to a convention, a writer's convention. But I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I, I accept what you say about them, and I think they are probably positive on the whole, but um, I, I, I'm i not terribly tempted. I, I yeah, did, I, I've, done book reading, I've done a book reading in the local bookstore, which, you know, had locals coming in and talking to me afterwards about it, and that was fun, and that was this kind of positive thing that you're talking about, actually. Yeah, but no, I think, I think it's that. I'll tell you at conventions, the only thing is I don't think you get negative people. What you will get is hyper fans that know more parts of the stories than you remember because you put some piece in to just connect to the next scene to make it to the casino in the scene and they're like oh my god that cab driver was my favorite and you're like what are you talking about like, 
there was a cab driver? <laughs> yeah, go back and look at your own book. But they're like, he was my favorite, Leo, the cab driver. And you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Theory, well, how much you forget about what you've written yourself so recently, even, you know? Uh, no, True. well, I, I think especially if you if you do a lot of writing, it's, I don't know, for me, I have to go back and like, when I'm writing in my series, I go back and either listen to the audiobook or reread the book so that I don't miss a step because I'm not a great researcher like it sounds like you are and I don't keep a world book. I'm very much a pantser. Um, when you wrote the two fiction novels, how did you approach them differently than the nonfiction? Well, the, the nonfiction, you have to you have to decide what argument you're making um, and what and how you're going to order that argument and how you're going to uh, fit the various quotations from the works that you're writing about into that ordered argument. So there's a huge amount of pre-arranging and pre-planning and so on. I mean, there's virtually no pantsing at all about it. Yeah, uh, no, it doesn't sound like it. I'm, I, <laughs> I would fail horribly at this. <laughs> but, um, but I haven't, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a sole pantser myself, although I believe in, in it, that pantsing can actually get, for example, it was by pantsing the beginning of that novel that I got into the voice of the, of you know the woman narrator um and after having written for a little while i then stopped and did an outline uh, but i didn't start with an outline i started with an idea you know she's she's a she's she does part-time work and one of the part-time jobs she does is for a uh, a detective a big detective agency in New York, in los angeles um where she just looks through videos that have been shot, you know, uh, surveillance videos, and marks them for the bits that they, you know, they need to use for evidence or what have you. So it's an incredibly, what should I say, routine, uninteresting job. You have actually listens to music while she's doing it. <laughs> and, uh, um, and then somebody asks her to investigate a missing person. So she actually becomes a truly amateur detective, you know, in, in, in the novel. But uh, that, I mean, that, that much I knew ahead, ahead of time. But how she actually solved the whole thing and where it was going to lead her and so on, it, I, I had to wait until I, you know, plotted it out in an outline. Well, that's interesting because I think mystery is a different, sort of a little bit of a different fish. Not that you don't have to have, um, you know, plot points and all this stuff, but mystery, especially good mystery, you have to have those little breadcrumbs that you leave that not everybody catches and then have a great whodunit at the end kind of or whatever Agreed. the thing is it's not as easy as even you know it's it's you know the tropes and how you write it and stuff i have a friend that was a romance writer and then started writing cozy mysteries and she was like oh this is very different you know she thought it would be a lot easier than it was round one for writing those yeah. mysteries and also, uh, I mean, writing one genre is um, a little less, what shall I say, challenging than if you mix the genres. And so far, both of my novels have, have mixed genres a lot. I mean, that first Money Matters uh, novel, you know, you have a, a coming of age, but it's a late coming of age because it's in the late 20s she's in. You have de Amateur Detective. You have, a, uh, towards the end, you have part of the Romance Convention. And in both novels, there's a sort of uh, big, uh, what should I say, there's a big political background. And that first novel took place during the midterm elections of 2010. And that was when Jerry Brown ran for governor and, and won against Meg Whitman. And instead of Meg Whitman, I have one of the characters. Um, you know, I replace her with one of the characters in the novel. So it's got a definite political background, you know, running, running right the way through it, as does the other novel too. So what kind of writer are you? Are you like, you can sit down, start at chapter one and write through straight to the end? Kind of like how Erica likes to do things or are you more chaotic like I am where you write these bits of pieces, get them all together and then somehow work it all out? Um, I, I think I'm closer to Erica. At least I certainly was in the first two books. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, currently I'm, 
tussling with the idea for the third book. And I've tried fancying and I've tried plotting and I still can't, can't get to come to terms with it. So that, that I mean, like you, I've, you know, I've got little chunks of it to try this out. Oh no, that doesn't work. That's in, you know, if it's in the first person. So I can't then show inside the head of the other guy. It's, it's actually about, I mean, the idea is to have somebody very rich and somebody homeless. Uh, and, you know, she, she, she actually enters his household as a housekeeper. Um, and the, gradually the two of them have to learn about each other's worlds um, and, I don't know. I'm, I might make him bankrupt in it. <laughs> well, the by the end of it, he loses it all and they trade places. <laughs> I'll, I'll give yeah. you a, 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 an idea, maybe helpful, maybe not, is if you just flip the chapters between the two of them. I did that. And then you can be in, it, in each of their heads. But I've seen a lot of people do that. And it's, I think, a very successful way to do that. I, I did it. Uh, using the present tense um, and and using the first person uh, in the second novel and I when I sent it to a professional editor she said it reads like a diary and I actually rewrote the I mean rewrote you know revised the entire thing to eliminate the I and eliminate the present tense <laughs> so that although it still has that, that what you're talking about the, you know the the point of view alternates if you like it you've got a third person who can also cheat and go into the other person's head if they want to, etc. Oh, I like that. I like that cheating. How much, how long did it take you to do Money Matters? How long did it take you to write it? Maybe, maybe 10, 10 months, something like that. And uh, Dangerous Conjectures was much shorter because it was during the pandemic. I mean, I was locked down and, you know, what else was there to do? You know, I, mean, I, I think I did it in six months or less. That's very cool. So, and you're in the midst of writing book three or what, it, what, is, what, is, of, what is coming uh, up for you? Planning. I'm in the midst of, of I'm, I'm thinking about and writing and doing research for book three. I mean, you know, like, like, like when I mentioned bankruptcy, well, actually it turns out that wouldn't work, but that maybe having the SEC do an investigation and shut the business down, that might work, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm playing around with all those sort of bits and pieces of it. And so, and you still do reviews. What is that like? Because normally I ask what it's like to do, do you review? Do you, re, do people besides doing reviews professionally, do writer friends ask you to read their books? Uh, no, actually, I, I, not recently at any rate, they haven't. Um, but the, the, you know, mainly that the reviews I do, I will write, I will pitch the idea first um to whoever it happened that whichever publication it is and then send it into them although recently uh what the one, one of my outlets which is sort of very reputable and has always loved taking it and publishing my work as it is with virtually no alteration i sent them this review of a biography of lawrence's middle years by this british woman author that was really peculiar. Um, I mean, for a start, taking the middle years only is very peculiar in itself, but um, so, I mean, she had some very, I, I, like, for example, she thought Lawrence was completely guided by Dante's um, Divine Comedy and that you know, everything he wrote was part of, part, his life and his work were all, first of all, you know, uh, the Inferno and then, you know, <laughs> oh, wow. parody, so it, was, it was crazy actually I thought so I wrote a fairly critical review although I was fit, trying to be fair-minded at the same time and say well it did have this advantage in bringing up for focus the the publication turned it down flat and uh, my what I what I heard was that it's likely to lead to too much correspondence for them to be able to <laughs> handle <it. When> <laughs> <laughs> you don't have the time to deal with the with the you know readers who <laughs> oh my god so what do you prefer doing do you enjoy doing the reviews over working on your book right now or is the doing the reviews and things like that just something kind of like a hobby that you do on the side they they balance each other out quite quite nicely actually um i mean i will only review i, I will I, I will only review a book i really like mainly 
Uh, I mean, that was an exception, the one that I told you about. I mean, I reviewed, for example, um, Rushdie's most recent book, uh, uh, Quixote, um, which was a, a modern version of Don Quixote, um, in which, you know, the knight um, drives an old automobile through America instead of, you know, riding That's a awesome. through Spain. <laughs> Um, and that was really fun. I mean, that, that, you know, and I liked the book so much that I thought, well, I uh, definitely I'll, I want to write a review of it. Do you do, um, how much reading do you do? Um, I'm, I'm not an avid reader. Um, I, I had to, to, to read a lot of stuff for preparation for when I was teaching. And it's, it's wonderful to be able to please yourself and say what you want to read or rather, you know, decide what you want to read on the spot. I'm currently, for example, reading um, um, Murakami, who is a writer, you know, the Japanese writer, novelist. I love his work. But this one, turns out, I didn't really realize until I got into it, this one's a thousand pages long. <laughs> That's a lot of reading. That is <laughs> a lot, lot of reading. reading. <laughs> that is a big book. Yeah. yeah. Oh, not, I'm not sure whether I will read through to the end of that particular one. <laughs> Well, it could take some time. Yeah, sure. I just realized we're we're almost out of time for the first part of this. Okay, so what advice would you give authors out there? Little nugget. Um, yeah. Listen to listen to any suggestions that you are given. Don't don't um, out of hand dismiss them. Then they always, even if you don't agree with them, they can be. In usefully, make, you know, in incorporated in other ways. Always, never be afraid to uh, erase whole paragraphs, even chapters. Um, it's much better. Sometimes when you find yourself in an impasse, you're in an impasse because you've written something that doesn't work and it needs to be eliminated in order to be able to move further forward. Uh, get professional advice. Always have a book if you're self self-published. Always have it professionally edited and make sure that you also have um, the cover professionally designed. Uh, amateur covers are so obvious, you can see them you know, all the time on Amazon, etc. cetera. Um, and, and be true to yourself. Don't, don't write, you know, in order to make your book a bestseller. Um, write, write what you think works for you. That is awesome. Okay, so <laughs> social media guru will want you to do this right. So how do people <laughs> find you? How do you want? Your social media person will want you to say the right thing. So how do no, people find you on Twitter and stuff like that? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I have, and she's helped me do this. I've, I've got a very full website. I'm mean, a very developed website, which you can get very easily under B H Finney, because I'm Brian Finney, B H F I N N E Y at B H Finney.com. Simple one to remember. Yes. And, um, uh, of course, you know, my books are all, uh, that are in print, are all available on uh, Amazon. Um, so you just put in, you know, whatever it is, Brian Finney, or you put in the title of the book you're interested in, like Money Matters. Awesome, awesome. And I'm, on, I'm on Instagram too, um, where I am Brian Finney Writer. So you gotta remember <laughs> all these handles now these days, <laughs> yeah, don't you? I know. <laughs> Oh my God, thank you so much for being on this podcast with us. It was really fun. Well, it was fun to talk to you both. Mm. Wonderful. Okay, so this mm. has been Drinking with Authors. I've been your host, Erica Lance. My guest host today has been C.R. Rice. And our lovely, amazing guest was Brian Finney. And we will see you guys next time.